This is a solar generator, as they advertise on the internet. And today we are going to have a open and honest conversation about their capabilities and what they can actually do. And I'm sure if you're like me and you follow lots of different lifestyle or off-grid or construction websites and YouTubes and everything else, you've probably seen 50 million ads for something that looks just like this. And there's a reason for it. They've become really popular over the last couple of years. I remember Jackery was probably one of the first big brands to come out and start advertising the camping space. And a bunch of creators have them and they're extolled on every channel possible. So sit back and get ready because today we're gonna do an in-depth conversation and look at these systems. And hopefully by the end of it, you're gonna have enough knowledge to decide whether or not something like this a bigger version, a smaller version is going to be what you need for your use case. And to do that, we're gonna cover four critical topics. The first is some simple math that you all can use to help calculate whether or not a device like this, a bigger one or a smaller one is gonna be right for you. Next, we're gonna talk about what they're good for and what they're not good for. And guess what? That's gonna be based on the math that we learn in part one. Next thing we're gonna talk about is environmental impact. Are these good for the environment to have? Do they really lower carbon emissions? We're gonna talk about that. Last but not least, we're gonna talk about the costs and what I use and the situation that we're in here at the cabin so we can look at a real tactical, real life example. There's a few things that you actually need to know when you're thinking about anything related to electricity. We need you to have a fundamental understanding of what a watt is, a watt hour, the different voltages that you're going to be using, and AC and DC power. If we can get the basics of those, what is it, four, five things, then you'll be in great shape. So let's start with watts. Using an acronym, watts is like miles per gallon in a car. It's how much energy you're consuming at that given point. When you think of a watt hour, that is like the energy in the gas tank. So how much fuel you have either consumed or how much fuel you have available to consume. So in order to get an understanding of watts for a device, there's a few ways you can look at it. First is they'll tell you. This in my hand is a 145 watt Apple charger for uh, my MacBook. I've got a 45 one uh, there for a MacBook Air. They tell you what they are. But on every charger, if you look closely on the bottom, not only will it tell you potentially what the wattage is, if it doesn't tell you that, it will tell you the amps and the voltage that it either consumes as an input or that it outputs. Usually they're gonna be close, but there is some efficiency loss when you're going from AC to DC power. Back of this charger, if you can tell from here, it says 140 watts USB-C adapter. Now, if we roll it onto this side, in small text, it'll tell us both the input and the output voltage. For a simple measure, because the input will always vary by a little degree, we're gonna look at what the output is, which says 28 volts and five amps. 28 volts times five amps will give you 140 watts, which is the capacity of this charger. Same thing goes for this one. And even on this little DC guy right here, on the bottom of it, we have five volts, and three amps. And that's the formula, by the way. If you multiply volts times amps, you will get watts. So every device is gonna be able to tell you what it has on it. And that's pretty critical when you're looking to calculate how much energy you actually need to produce. One other thing to note is that not everything is consistent. And this is a generalized formula that's gonna work 85 to 90% of the time, right? If I plug this in, right now um, for this laptop, chances are it probably will use all 140 watts uh, from this device, which will give you a sense of peak power that this needs to produce. Now, at the same point, I can also use a, if this was only capable of doing 100 watts, I could use a lower rate charger. So let's talk about watts and how it relates to a battery like this. Now, this is a 500 watt hour battery from Blue TTI or is it Blue Eddy? I don't really know how to pronounce it but there's bigger ones, there's smaller ones, but they all have the same fundamentals. Most batteries 
have what they call a peak or a surge wattage amount. And then they have what they call a running wattage amount. The surge is how much power this thing can let loose at an instantaneous moment to help turn on something, usually that has an electric motor inside, like a fridge compressor. It has a very high initial draw to energize the motor and then a very low running um, wattage. And by a short period of time, I mean very short, like 0.1 to 0.5 of a second short. This isn't like, oops, I plugged in 400 watts on a 300 watt device and it should be okay for 30 minutes. It's like, no, it's that for a split second. So you need to think about the peak watts. So in a case like a fridge, it's gonna need like 1600 watts to energize that compressor, but then it might only need 300 watts to run. Next thing you're gonna see with pretty much any one of these devices is that most of the ports, if you get a good one, are labeled, right? Like this port down here, this is a 45 watt USB-C connector. We've got five volts and three amps for 15 watts on DC. This is 12 volts at three amps at a 300 watt AC outlet with a peak surge of 400 watts. It's all labeled, it's very simple. Even on the back here, we say input power and I can do 12 volts, uh, or sorry, 12 amps at 40 volts, 120 watts max. So that's for the solar input or for anything else that's on the backside of this device. If you use more power than is rated, it will act like a circuit breaker in your house and it'll turn off, it'll trip. So it's pretty key that you actually like pay attention to those numbers. Next, we're gonna talk about watt hours. And like I said, watt hours is like the gasoline in the gas tank of your car. It's how much potential energy you have to use. Um, some could also compare it to like, if watts is the flow rate of the water coming out of your hose, then watt hours is how many buckets you fill. So it's kind of the amount of total energy that's been consumed. So I wanna put this in simple terms. If I had a 10 watt hour battery and I had a 10 watt light bulb, that would mean theoretically that I could run that light bulb for one hour. So 10 watts times one hour equals 10 watt hours. And that's the equation. Watts times time equals watt hours. So you wanna do that in hours as your unit of measurement. Or you can do another equation just so we can test this out a bit more. If I had a 10 watt light bulb and I ran it for 30 minutes, how much watt hours have I consumed? So that would be 10 watts times 0.5 hours is going to give you five watt hours of consumption. Now let's relate it to this battery that I have here on the table. This is a 500 watt hour battery. My Starlink router uses around 50 watts. How long could I run this for? Take 500 watt hours that you have, divide by 50 watts, and you're gonna be left with 10 hours. So that's the simple mathematics, and I want you to apply that, broadly speaking, to any product. Let's imagine I had a bigger one of these, and I had a EcoFlow Delta Max, which is uh, 2,000 watt hours, 2016 to be specific, or kind of two kilowatt hours, if you divide by 1,000, how long could you run a 1,000 watt space heater? Pretty simple, divide 2,000 watt hours by 1,000 watts and you'll get two hours. And that's kind of some of the basics of the math that you need to know. Now, while this math is incredibly simplistic and it is like the most simple form of how this works, because some devices power on and off, some might use higher current at the beginning, like when you're charging up a laptop, right? It'll go to 50 or 75% very quickly and then it'll taper off. But the general thing that I want you to be thinking about is those current numbers. And the other part is too, there are efficiencies and losses. You know, when you're converting from DC power in a battery to AC, there is a little bit of percentage loss in there. But more or less, if you focus on those macro numbers, you're gonna be able to predict your needs very easily. Moving on, let's talk about 
what these are good for and what they're not good for. So I'm going to break this into two categories. The first is going to be recreational use. And the next is going to be thinking of this as a home backup solution. And that's how a lot of these things are marketed on Indiegogo or on the website or in their Facebook ads is usually either great for RV or, you know, camping, or it's going to be, this is a great solution for your emergency power needs or your whole home backup. I'm going to start with recreational. And just for reference, just because it uses the name generator does not mean it is one. This is a battery bank. It can be charged with solar. It can be charged with an AC outlet. It can be charged with the DC from your car, but it is a battery bank. So let's not get that confused. These things are great when you have short-term use cases where power is not available or very limited, such as camping. And frankly, that's why we have one. We take ours along to charge our phones, to blow up the air mattress, recharge flashlights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's also great for charging up all of my cameras and things when we're on the go, or if we're up at a job site for our renovation project, I can charge power tools with it, and it's excellent. A larger version of this, like an EcoFlow or a Jackery 3000, would be great for powering even bigger devices, like maybe you're running a microwave for a few minutes inside of your RV, or you have a Dometic fridge, or you have your RV fridge, or you have a propane or a diesel heater that you want to run through the night very comfortably because the diesel is what's providing the heat, but this is just blowing the fan. Those are all great things to power with something like this. What it is not good for, and what most electric things are not good for, are large sustained loads. That would mean things like an electric hot plate. Uh, you will wreck a battery in terms of consumption so fast. Um, a standard heating element on an electric stove is 1500 watts. That would burn this out in probably 15 minutes if we could actually support that with an inverter, right? Um, if you had even a bigger one of these, a two kilowatt or a three kilowatt one, and you were running the AC system in an RV, that draws probably 1,000 or 1,500 watts, you're looking at clearing that out in like two to three hours. So that's really not what it's good, looking good for. And they're not great for heating either, for electric resistance heating. One kilowatt hour is 3,412 BTUs. One therm of natural gas is 100,000. It's better to run the blower for the fan than it is to actually try to produce the heat from. If you went out and you looked at all these videos on our YouTube, they're like, oh my God, look at all the range of the things that you can power with this. Um, but if you look closely at it, you'll see on the screen there that in two hours or 30 minutes, that thing's tapped out. And that's not what you want if you're going camping for the weekend. You want something that would theoretically be able to power all your needs for the duration of time that you're out. And yes, solar does help. But the thing you have to know about solar is use the math above because just as that calculates the discharge, you can also use it to calculate the charge. So if I have a 500 watt hour battery and I want to get that back up to charge and I have a 100 watt solar panel, assuming that all 100 watts could be put into this thing to charge the battery, that would take five hours, right? And if I had a 200 watts of solar and this could take 200 watts, that would be great. But if I'm using 100 watts while getting 100 watts from the sun, then my net is zero charge to the battery. So you gotta be thinking about those things when you're using it. And like I said, use that simple math that we taught before to help you size the solution. I'm just finishing up editing this section and I decided I wanted to break this film into two parts. Part one, we've talked about the math and we've talked about recreational use, which is something that I use our battery pack for all the time. But I realized that when we're talking about backup power for your house or for this cabin, that's a really big topic because there's a lot that goes into it. So as a result, in part two, we're going to do a full walk around of our property. We're going to really talk about what you need for your emergency backup power needs and how I think about that. I have a background in electrical engineering and have done some grid design work. So this is um, an area that I have some good expertise in. Hopefully, if you like this content, please like, subscribe, and get ready to follow us next week.